Good morning, everyone. I'm Nathan, and I'm going to be talking about median.jl, a package to simulate the inside of a cell and other kind of active matter systems. So first, I'd like to acknowledge these people who have helped um, work on median and contribute to the code. Um, so I'm going to start by showing this kind of output of a median simulation. So this code was all um, running inside Julia. And in this simulation, there are kind of four main agent types. So we have motors in red, um, links, branch points, and filaments. So you can see them all kind of moving around in 3D here. And this work was done in collaboration with Ed Ginniger's lab at uh, NIH. So their lab is studying um, axon growth, so how neurons can grow and kind of be guided to connect to the right place. Um, yeah, so this kind of simulation volume is roughly the kind of size of a growing tip of an axon um, in a fruit fly. And these kind of four components are some of the key components that kind of help axons move around as they're growing. Another kind of special thing about this system is that it's active. So inside a cell, each of these components is kind of like a complex molecular machine that's using, it's actually using chemical fuels inside the cell um, to perform its actions. Oh, yeah? Yeah, so you can kind of see, oh, you can't see my mouse, but in the top left corner, um, the simulation is going on for 2,000 seconds. You can see it's kind of getting clustered in the center. So this is the same movie, but um, showing a cross section and a much kind of zoomed in view. And so you can much better see what the individual kind of components are actually doing to the filament system. So the motors are kind of binding between two filaments and then creating forces between them. Um, and you can see the branch points are kind of nucleating new filaments off the sides of, of, an, of the initial filaments. Yeah, so things disappearing, that's mostly due to, um, well, half of it is because this is a cross-section. So when things go on the other side of the cross-section, they disappear. The other thing is that the kind of chemistry of the, these cytoskeletal systems are very active. So when two kind of fibers become cross-linked, 
that crosslink is very te temporary. So on the kind of second time scale, these different crosslinks are unbinding and binding to different random places, and that's what kind of makes it such a dynamic network. Yeah, so based on the kind of two previous movies, you can see that everything's kind of getting clustered towards the center. Um, but something really cool is that in addition to just clustering, um, the filaments are actually being polarized kind of by these um, motor proteins. So here you can see I've labeled the filaments by their kind of direction that they're pointing. Um, and you can see it start, starts all jumbled up, but then as time progresses, they start getting kind of sorted. So they're all pointing towards the center as well. And this kind of leads us to the next thing. Um, but first I'll go over some, a few details, of the kind of numerics on the scale of these simulations. So in the previous simulations, there were around a quarter of a million kind of individual actin monomers making up the filaments. Um, and each kind of system state snapshot is around 200 kilobytes. The initial, the initial conditions and parameters for the simulations were ported from work by Arvind, um, and he had run this on our previous uh, C++ implementation. And running these simulations used to take us multiple weeks. Um, but now in Julia, we can run them in around three days on a single core just kind of four gigabytes of memory. So here's kind of like a high level kind of difference between our, our new Julia version and, and the old previous C++ version. So one big thing is that the code is a lot simpler. So it's only 15,000 lines of code instead of 70,000 lines of code. Um, an interesting kind of trade-off is that even though the kind of core code is much simpler, currently the code needed to kind of set up the system is a little bit more complicated. So in C++, we had a special configuration language to set up these simulations, but in the current version, we're just using Julia itself to configure the simulations, which is a slightly more verbose than a specialized kind of domain-specific language. Another kind of huge thing is that if, if you're running one of these simulations and somebody like trips over a power cable, for example, and s suddenly your computer has lost power, you can just kind of plug, plug it back in, reboot the computer, and you're off continuing your simulation as if kind of nothing had happened. Um, currently, there are a few issues of, uh, of doing this on Windows and on Linux with the network file system, but I'm working on those kind of bugs. So the last thing is kind of the C++ code had a kind of object-oriented programming style with a kind of distributed state, whereas in Julio, I'm trying out kind of having an explicit centralized state. So kind of now to the kind of motivation for running these simulations. We want to explore how these kind of nanometer scale cytoskeletal components can self-organize to reshape a whole cell at the kind of micrometer scale. So here on the left is one of the most important videos in biology, and it's showing a, oops, it's showing a neutrophil chasing a bacteria. So you can see it's kind of making decisions, figuring out how it should move to chase the bacteria. And this cell doesn't have a brain, it's just this big, massive combination of all these 
molecular machines that are each kind of consuming chemical fuels. Um, and so the cytoskeleton, you can think of it kind of like this big motor that takes in chemical fuels and creates forces to move a cell around. But it's kind of more than that. So the kind of actual decision making and guidance of the cell is also key. That also kind of is deeply connected with the mechanics of the cytoskeleton. So on the right, you can see a similar kind of cell guidance and motion um, system, in this case, a growing neuron. So to be able to really understand these systems, we need to be able to simulate both the chemistry and the mechanics of these complicated uh, nanoscale molecular machines. So here's, I'm now gonna kind of go into the details of how we actually run these simulations. So this is kind of an overview of the state of a median simulation. So we have these filaments that are composed of individual monomers, which are, can each be in a chemical state. And then we have links between these filaments. In addition, we discretize space into these chemistry voxels. And in each voxel, we keep track of the number of various chemicals. So yeah, as I said, we're discretizing 3D space into these chemical voxels. And in each voxel, we assume that they're well mixed. And so we can use mass action kinetics. Um, and so then we simulate chemistry in each of these voxels separately. And we allow chemical species to diffuse between the different voxels. And so this whole system can be modeled as, as a jump process. So I'm going to go into the, a specific example of chemistry of how we model a poly polymerizing filament. So there are two kind of possible events. The first is diffusion. So here you can see one of these green circles can jump out of the, this voxel. And the kind of rate at which this happens is going to be proportional to the number of green circles in the voxel. The second event in this example is a polymerization. So here, one of these green circles attaches to the end of the filament. And the rate at which this happens is going to be proportional to the number of green circles times the number of filament ends in the voxel. OK, so how do we speed up chemistry in, in our new Julia version of over 10 times compared to the C++ version? So one kind of key thing to, to notice is that in a typical median simulation, 99% of the chemical events are actually just these simple diffusion reactions. So we really focused on making those diffusion reactions super fast and efficient. Uh, the second thing is if you want to simulate jump processes quickly, either directly use jumpprocesses.jl or try and take as many ideas as you can from it. So we're using, um, yeah, a lot of ideas from jumpprocesses.jl. OK, so that's great for kind of simulating polymer chemistry. But what happens when a filament polymerizes into a wall? So here we have a filament next to a wall. And we add a new monomer. But now suddenly, there's this huge force due to the filament intersecting with the wall. So we have to kind of move the whole filament back a little bit. OK, so how do we actually do this in the simulation? Well, so we have a whole kind of mechanics model in addition to chemistry. So on the left, you can see in chemistry, we have this idea of filaments being composed of a chain of monomers. And then when we do mechanics, we kind of coarse grain further and treat filaments as a chain of these cylinders. So then we have a, a large variety of different force terms. And right at mechanical equilibrium, everything has a net force of 0. So we solve this problem using conjugate gradient descent I'm currently using optim.jl. OK. 
Okay, so one of the big issues that we ha that um, I came across when trying to do this is the whole issue of filament crossover. So how do you prevent two kind of cylinders from intersecting? So what we want here, this is kind of a blue cylinder coming out of the screen and a red cylinder going up and down. And so as we do our minimization, we want them to kind of come into contact and then not teleport through each other. Unfortunately, what can happen? Because we're solving this kind of on a computer, everything is happening in discrete steps. So if your steps are really big, you can easily um, come into situations where these filaments end up kind of teleporting through each other, which kind of can ruin the whole topology of the system. So there are kind of three parts to how we solve this. Um, the first is you want to have a maximum step size between force evaluations. So whichever kind of uh, optimization algorithm you're using, you have to limit how far it's allowed to change the system between evaluating the forces. The other thing is we have a special smooth pairwise cylinder-cylinder repulsion force. Um, and the last thing is we need a neighbor list so that we're only calculating the forces between pairs of cylinders that are nearby. Um, and we're using cell list map to help as a kind of first stage in generating that. Okay, so kind of this is an overview of what we're doing in Median. So first, we evolved the network using chemical stochastic simulation. That causes local deformations which change the potential energy. And then we me mechanically equilibrate the network based on those deformations. And then the last step is that those forces can actually change the chemical reaction rates. So we use those forces to update the chemical reaction rates and then start running chemical simulation again. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about kind of extensibility, the extensibility of this model. So in theory, it's super easy to add new kind of things to this model. So if you want new chemistry, just add a new rate and effect. If you want new mechanics, just add a new force term. Um, in practice, it is pretty easy, but sometimes you also have to figure out how to solve kind of complicated 3D geometry puzzles at scale. And one thing I can say about Julia is it's a lot easier to solve 3D math problems in Julia than C++. So here are some of the things that we've kind of added to, that, to this base model so far. So one thing is a huge range of different filament chemistries. So we have capping proteins, branching, motor proteins, cross-linking, um, and yeah. Another really cool thing that uh, Hao Ran Ni has added is this deformable membrane mechanics model. So we can actually have a filament network inside instead of a rigid boundary or kind of artificial box. We can actually have these networks running in more of a biological deformable membrane. So here you can see it causing a protrusion in the membrane. Another thing we've added is, um, or we're working on is filament membrane links. Um, so here you can see the yellow are kind of links between the filaments attaching to the membrane. So in conclusion, kind of the point is that we're using Julia to explore how these different nanometer scale um, components of the cytoskeleton are self-organizing to create cell scale structures. Um, in the future, we'd like to add in more detailed and complex components and interactions to hopefully kind of build towards the eventual goal of a whole cell, cell scale simulation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes? Uh, is the deformable membrane in Julia code or is it separate? Oh. Should you should I hand them this? Is the deformable membrane code in Julia or is it a separate? 
Yeah, so that deformable membrane code is also in Julia. Um, yeah. Uh, the picture of the uh, movie of the white blood cells chasing a bacteria, so there was chemotaxis or some sort of basically sensory uh, signal. Do you have that in your models? I mean, do you, the chemical rate depends on some sort of external factors, or how do you model for this? Yeah, so we have basic kind of compartmental chemistry for the chemistry going on inside the cell. Um, in terms of the kind of cell sensing external signals, um, something that we're working on is adding in kind of membrane chemistry, um, but that's still kind of a work in progress. Very cool talk. Um, what so? What gave the big speed up in moving from C plus plus to Julia? Do you know like what components of like was it algorithmic changes or and what were they or? Yeah, so it was mostly kind of high level algorithmic changes. Um, so, yeah, in, in our initial C plus um, plus code, we were using something called the next reaction method to simulate our chemistry, and we thought that that was kind of like the fastest thing. And then we tried out jumpprocesses.jl and realized that there are a lot faster algorithms. Um, so now we're using something more like um, something called like the direct CR method. Um, but we've had to kind of modify it to add in uh, filament chemistry. The other big kind of reason for the speed up is how we're modeling the filament volume exclusion. So preventing the filament crossover. So we have a much kind of much more sophisticated way that we're building the neighbor list to do that and how we're calculating those forces. I mean, that sounds fantastic. Uh, you know, the guy who you're talking to is the guy who implemented the direct CR, right? Um, oh. So, so uh, I'm wondering, though, you know, it, it sounds like you have a nice case with a nice Julia package here and everything. We love to have these kind of benchmarks around, uh, especially for very large systems. Mm -hmm. our, our test cases on, on the large systems right now are kind of things like, you know, diffusion, which are easy to make large. But it sounds like you have a, a real, real case here. I'm wondering if, if uh, we can get a version of your code into this IML benchmark, so that way we can more clearly benchmark over all the, the jump processes that you're using and track the process. Yeah, so, well, actually, kind of 99% of the reactions that we deal with are just diffusion reactions. So actually, kind of just the diffusion system would probably be a good benchmark for, for this. Um, but, so currently we're not kind of directly using jumpprocesses.jl um, because kind of when a, when a callback happens, um, kind of we don't necessarily know a priori what the dependencies, so like what, what exactly that callback will mutate in the system. So I had some trouble kind of figuring out how to build the dependency graphs for that um, because it's more of a kind of dynamic thing. Right. Yeah, I guess we could look into getting a dynamic dependency graph. So yeah, let's let's chat after that. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I came late, so maybe you spoke to this. But typically in uh, simulations, you integrate microstates, and, and you get uh, the whole system evolution. Do you use any high-level goals or constraints? So, I'm not sure if I fully understand the question, but by microstates, I guess, so each kind of simulation we run is kind of like sampling from a space of trajectories. So typically when we run these simulations, we're running like 100 at a time. Um, and in addition, there are a lot of kind of parameters that we don't know 
or even know the kind of order of magnitude of. So we have to run kind of large kind of parameter sweeps. Right. But from time to time, you may want to aggregate over those uh, traces. And from the aggregate statistic, uh, tweak something. So generate an event or tweak the parameters. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. We don't have any kind of ter current automated ways of doing that. Thank you. Okay. 